Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I wanted to welcome all of the realtors in the room. Thank you for being here. We know that this is going to be some very interesting content, um, very relevant. And I will ask everybody to please silence your cell phones. <laughs> uh, the panelists too. Um, we also have uh, members of the public are joining via Zoom. So this session is also being recorded. So we will be able to share that afterwards as well. Um, we have a fantastic discussion lined up to help you become more familiar with some recently implemented zoning regulations or just ones that you may not have necessarily been aware of that were available to you. Um, this will be helpful to you either as a current property owner, a buyer or seller, or as a realtor advising your clients. Um, as I introduce our panelists, I would just love to note that I love nothing more than when a member comes to me and says, I have an idea for an event. I have already have buy-in from the speakers and we just need to set a date. So I wanna thank Mark Pruner um, for making that phone call. Um, that's really what being a member of the association is about, is sharing knowledge and helping to engage other members um, for the Actually, betterment. Margarita told me I had to do it. Uh, well, thank you, Margarita, <laughs> for being a, an honorary GAR member then. Um, but really, this is what it's all about and helping to further our partnerships with communi the community, town hall, um, and the public. So um, I'll give a couple of uh, sentences about each of the panelists to get, help you get more familiar with them. Mark Pruner has been a Greenwich Realtor for 13 years and works with Compass Real Estate as part of the Greenwich Streets team. He previously worked as a real estate attorney for a private law firm here in Greenwich and for Aquarian Water Company, the largest private landowner in Connecticut. He has been elected twice to the Town Board of Assessment Appeals, which hears appeals of property valuations. He has served on the RTM, the Greenwich Affordable Housing Partnership, and the Greenwich Historic Preservation Network. He also is on a committee to preserve the Selick Grist Mill, the oldest commercial structure in Greenwich. He writes a weekly real estate column for the Greenwich Sentinel. Um, on our far right, we have Margarita Albin. Margarita has been on the Planning and Zoning Commission since 2006 and has been chair for four years. Previously, she worked with ExxonMobil. Margarita has restored historic homes, volunteered with local hospitals, church organizations, the Junior League, in pet therapy at elementary schools and as an EMT. She holds advanced degrees in general management and accounting and fun fact, she's fluent in Spanish and French. And in the center here, we have Tom Hegney. Tom is a partner at the Greenwich firm of Hegney, Lennon, and Slane. He is a past member of the RTM, Planning and Zoning Commission, and Board of Education. He has served on numerous building committees for the public schools and chaired five of them. He is a past board member and president of Abelis, past president and board member of the Board of Trustees of Greenwich Library, and current board member and past chairman of Greenwich Green and Clean. So you can tell these guys have a lot of free time on their hands. Um, without further ado, I will let our panelists take it away. Thank you, Stacy. So today we're going to be talking about three things, but let's actually start, particularly for the public members who are on Zoom, with the most basics. Uh, in Greenwich, you have a right to rent your house out to rumors. Um, so that's one way to generate uh, money, and there's no requirement that you file any applications for doing that. The reason for ADUs, accessory dwelling units, is because all of these houses are in a single family zone. And so therefore, the, you're only allowed to have one kitchen. With an accessory dwelling unit, uh, you file the application, which they've simplified as we'll hear in a little bit, and you can put in, a, put in an extra kitchen for the rental units. And that rental unit can either be in the present structure or in an, uh, in an accessory structure. The other thing we have or in order to preserve our historic houses is a historic overlay. If you uh, 
get permission from that, you get additional FAR, or uh, if approved, you have the right to build an additional structure with, with the kitchen. Uh, and we'll, there are some details on that we'll go into. And then lastly, if you've got a lot that's double sized, you can split it into two lots, sell off one lot if you want, or have your children build a house on the other lot. Those are just like the other lots in your neighborhood. Um, they're built for uh, anyone who wants to buy and live on that lot. So without further ado, uh, let's tell the story of this wonderful couple who um, they retired and they're looking to stay in Greenwich. Uh, they've lived here for 47 years, beautiful people. Uh, their retirement income is getting tight, particularly with inflation. And they're considering renting out part of their 4,500 square foot house for extra monthly income. But they don't want rumors. So they, they want a separate unit either in their house, or they're also thinking about an 800 square foot pool house. So Tom, what are their options in a situation like this for an ADU? Um, morning, everyone. Uh, the, the ADUs are not something that is brand new for our regulations. It's been around for decades. There are actually, according to the PNZ staff, 98 ADUs that have already been permitted through the process, but they had restrictions on them. So you had to be either the tenant or the owner had to be over 62, or you had to rent it uh, as an affordable unit. And with those restrictions, some people were not willing or able uh, to do that. Um, so the change that was made in the regulations in July of this year, so it's, it's really very new, uh, was to open it up. And part of that was prompted by a state law that was passed two years ago that Margarita is much more familiar with than, than almost anybody, um, to require towns to provide uh, accessory dwelling units as of right. And uh, they, the state law also gave the ability to opt out, which Greenwich has done. Uh, but the commission thought we should really be looking at this on our own basis. And that's why the regulation was adopted uh, in, in July. So um, uh, the, the, the people that want to uh, have uh, some additional income for a, uh, an, a dwelling unit on their property, um, so how big can it be? Well, it depends on where they live, uh, how much property they have, uh, what the size of their house is, what the size of their accessory buildings, such as a garage, a barn, a pool house is. So uh, with the handout uh, that uh, we distributed uh, for a accessory building, so that would be something detached from the main house. If you're in the R6, R7, R12, it can be 800 square feet. If you're in the R20 or a one it can be up to 1,000 square feet. And then the two and four acre zones, it can be 1,200 square feet. Uh, matches to a certain extent what we have for special exception uses in the regulations already. It's a little bit more generous, uh, both in the uh, uh, smaller zones and the middle zones, about the same size in the two and four acre zone. Uh, so the pool house that the people may have been using as an accessory dwelling already, uh, they can actually go through the process and make it legal. Uh, and there is no limit on uh, who uh, can rent it or what the rent can be. Uh, one requirement is though that you have to live in the house. So you can't uh, create it as uh, a, your primary dwelling that you're renting out and you're also renting out your pool house as a separate dwelling. Uh, you have to live there. Do you have to live there year round? No, if you don't like snow, you can go south and spend a few months there. Uh, but it needs to be your residence that you, uh, that. Uh, that you use at least on a majority of the basis. Um, one of the things that's come up, and, and it, it's not so much in a detached building, but if you wanted to have it in your house and you had a wing that you could uh, use as a separate dwelling, uh, you're limited to 35% of the floor area of the house. 
So if you have a 10,000 square foot house, you could have an accessory dwelling that's 3,500 square feet. Not necessarily what the Planning and Zoning Commission was yes. just thinking but, of. Yes, it was what we were thinking. He's wrong. So, you know, when I when I think when I think of an accessory dwelling, I don't really think of something 3,500 so, square feet, which is about the size of my so house. Our so our thinking was that if you were very wealthy and you had a 10,000 square foot house, you might want to put your mother-in-law in a 3,500 square foot apartment in that 10,000 square foot house. And that would be accessory and subsidiary to your primary use. So we were thinking that absolutely. Ken is the trying state to get law, hi Ken, the state law, what's that called when you bust in? So the state law actually limits it to 30%, the lower of 30% or a thousand square feet. And we thought, that, given the scale of houses in Greenwich, is not very much. Right. Hey, Borsuk, we're running no a. No one can log into the zoo. What? No one can log into the zoo. It, it, Talk to Jenny. We are working on it. <laughs> okay. Um, it's being right. recorded. I was wondering because I, I knew that there were several people that were trying to come in and I wasn't seeing them. So the state is much smaller. And we thought if we want to have it work in Greenwich, we should do it bigger. And then we waited for people to, yes, it is big. And we meant to do that. In fact, I had it even bigger at one point. <laughs> so, and we argue like this all the time. He's usually over there. Yeah, I usually, I'm usually where you are being, uh, being chastised that, for I whatever him I just wrong. happened to say. <laughs> so and we've been doing yeah. it since 2006. And we're friends, sort of. Yeah, sort of, sort of. <laughs> Not necessarily on Tuesday nights, but yes. Uh, so yes, we did intend it. Can I turn off my mic now? Okay. Please. <laughs> um, what, what, one of the things that you run across with this is the building department will look at this or has in the past looked at this as new construction, which requires a different code review than if it was just a, 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 um, an alteration uh, to the dwelling. That can result in additional costs for creating one within your house. And so before you even start the process, which has been abbreviated with the planning and zoning staff, it's best to also go down and talk to the plan reviewer at the building department. That way, if there are going to be expensive changes to the house that you're going to need to make, uh, you can decide whether it's something you really want to pursue. If it's $10,000 and you're going to be renting this out uh, for a few thousand dollars a month, that may make sense. If it's going to be $100,000 and you're only going to get a couple of thousand dollars a month, you may think that it's not necessarily the thing you want to do. Um, the, the form that planning and zone, the planning and zoning staff, and you're not dealing necessarily with the commission on this, so it's, it's a much more abbreviated and pleasant process that you're going through. Um, yeah, it's a, I, I rarely get to respond in things in that kind of way when I'm presenting to the commission. So I just want to take advantage of it when I have it. <laughs> And no, Marguerite is not going to forget it, whether it's recorded or not. Um, uh, the, uh, the process is one where you have to have plans. And so do you need to bring an architect in? Maybe. You may have a builder that has the ability to put plans together that can be submitted for the, uh, to the planning and zoning staff. Uh, you need a survey. Uh, you need to get a copy of the town's geographic information system map. You need to get a copy of the assessor's card. Um, and you need to be able to describe how this will interact and what the square footage is of your total house and what the accessory dwelling uh, will be. You'll want to have a separate entrance for it. And how does that get handled? Um, I filed one earlier in October. Um, I spoke with the planning and zoning staff yesterday, something that will be reviewed this week. So I think you're looking at probably about a month from the time you file it 
to the time you could expect a, a decision on it. There may be a request for additional information or clarification on size of rooms or square footage. Um, uh, but it, it's intended to be something that a homeowner can do on their own. Um, they will need the help either of a builder or an architect or both, uh, and they'll need a survey. Now, they may already have a survey of their property. If they don't, uh, if they're doing it on the interior of the house, um, I'm wondering whether a GIS map could substitute for a survey. I'm, I'm looking, when, when the commission adopted this, my, my question was, how are we gonna make this something that encourages people to do it so that we actually have a regulation that does something? Uh, and how do we reduce the costs? You know, make, make it user-friendly, make it cost-effective. And um, we do have a lot of information here in, in town hall, particularly with the GIS and, and the information in the assessor's office. So perhaps uh, when the staff looks at it, if it's not everything that's on the checklist for a, an ADU, uh, they can make an adjustment for a particular circumstance so you're not really having to do it on the actual letter of what um, the, the uh, checklist for the form has. It's a very, very brief form. Uh, all the forms that uh, we'll be talking about are on uh, the town's website and um, either through the building department or if you go to the, the PNZ section, um, there are many, many forms that are listed on that uh, on that web, on that portion of the website, and certainly something that uh, uh, are uh, easy to uh, to access and and fill in. Are, are we going to handle this with questions? I well, I, actually, I, I see Rick with his hand up. I see John. Yeah, with his so hand we're, we're going to uh, we're going to have questions for all of these after we've gone after we've gone through these. Each one we're uh, about twenty five minutes on the first one, and then fifteen minutes on each of the others. And we'll have a half an hour of questions starting at uh, 1030. But Margarita is going to tell us about how now that Tom has made this application, the um, commission and the staff are, are looking at this application and what's uh, what are points that need to be clarified or the important points in the application. So actually, the important thing is that, as Tom said, it's a lot more pleasant because the commission doesn't see it. OK. So um, staff looks at it, it's what we call as of right, unless you have a non-conforming property. And our intent is to facilitate it so uh, as they start coming in, because it hasn't been that long since we changed the regulation, we will keep easing the process, make sure the building department goes smoothly. Tom and I, as we were working on this, we're talking about whether the building department could be requiring more than was intended. Uh, the, the key is that you have building code on these, that you meet building code and that they be safe. Uh, that's the most important thing for us at the moment. You do have to provide a parking spot for the ADU, but it does not have to be a garage space. So most people can figure out how to do that. Uh, and you can have, as Tom said, all the cooking facilities and whatever you want, which you can't at present do and you can do them in all the zones. If you were already a two family, I can't remember if you said this, in the R6, you can't add two, you can't add more dwellings. The maximum is two. Okay, so, but I don't think your demand is gonna be as much in the R6 because they can go to two family. All right, I don't have anything else to add. Yeah, really. uh, just to pick up on uh, the last, uh, one of the last comments Margarita made, uh, if you are an undersized lot, uh, you're not eligible to do this on an administrative basis. You would have to file a site plan and special permit with the Planning and Zoning Commission. So if if I have a, I'm in the one acre zone and I have a three quarter acre lot, I have to file a site plan and special permit with the Planning and Zoning Commission for a hearing because I don't meet the minimum lot size in the zone. Also, if I want to make my accessory building 2,000 square feet, 
rather than 1,000 or 1,200 square feet, I also need to go for a special permit with the Planning and Zoning Commission. So that, that requires a hearing. Used to be here, now it's all on Zoom. Uh, uh, and that's something I think the commission will continue to look at uh, if they see a lot of these come in and it's not something that necessarily needs to be reviewed by them and can be handled by staff, they'll they'll look at making adjustments, right? Absolutely. Yeah, but, I mean, the, the whole intent is to make this easier. Yeah. So Margarita, let's say somebody actually just say they wanna build a 27 foot high pool house in front of a historic lake and are putting in a uh, apartment on the second floor of that pool house, but it's primarily a pool house. Do they have any obligation to rent that out? Or is this another way to uh, just create a, uh, additional affordable housing? No, no um, we took out all the affordable housing provision. Right. Previously, we restricted these to disabled, affordable, and senior. And we took all that out because people wanted more flexibility. Uh, you're not required to rent it out. Okay. Glad to agree. <laughs> We agree on a few things now and then. <laughs> okay, so let's now you can tune in on Thursday night for this, the continuation of the banter. Yeah, there'll be quite a bit of it Thursday night, actually. <laughs> so let's let's continue on to the historic overlay. Well, uh, do you, do you want to have questions on the ADUs we'll, first, Mark? We'll do the questions. Yeah, at, just, at the end. I can never remember my that, questions. That way, so I hope we'll you get guys through can. all of this on time. And then knowing this audience, right. I'm sure we'll have more than a few questions. Okay, so to, you guys just to have to remember your yeah. questions. So, yeah, I'm write not good. down, write okay, down your I'm questions. Okay, I'm not good at that. And we'll, we'll get to them right after we do the uh, lot split. So in this situation, uh, a young couple from out of town has moved in. They bought an 1880 Victorian. It's a 3,000 square foot fixture upper on a one acre lot in a one acre zone. The lot is uh, narrow and deep and the older house as they like to do so their horses didn't have to um, ride to the back of the lot and they could get off in the front is closer to the street than allowed under present setback requirements in an RA1. They, they are considering tearing down the house. I mean, the guy is just totally interested in what's gonna maximize his amount of money for the property. So he's going, should I tear down the house and build a new one? Should I fix it up? And then he hears about the historic overlay and he goes, great, I can build a second house. So um, they want to see how doing the historic overlay and preserving the historic home uh, uh, works versus just doing a tear down or a renovation. So Tom, what are the, uh, what are the uh, family's options with creating a historic overlay uh, on this uh, conforming lot that's fairly deep? So uh, historic overlays uh, require a uh, certificate of appropriateness from the Historic District Commission. So rather than starting with the Planning and Zoning Commission, you're really starting with the Historic District Commission and getting a read from them. Uh, they want to know why this particular building is worth preserving. Uh, does it have any particular distinctive features? Uh, and it, we're talking about the exterior of the building, not the interior. The, the Historic District Commission does not control, except in one or two instances that happened in the past, uh, the interior of the house. They're just looking at the exterior, preserving particular features that it may have and what make it distinctive. Uh, and this is not something that's in, in a, a a uh, historic district like uh, Strickland Road, for example, or around or a small portion of Round Hill, uh, this would be any property. Uh, the historic overlay zone is usually used more for uh, commercial buildings because it expands the type of uses you can use. Uh, and if you're in an if you're rezoned to an historic overlay, you get to use any use that's permitted in any business zone. With homes, uh, the, in, the incentive is to provide for an additional dwelling unit uh, or a fraction thereof that can be considered a dwelling unit uh, and getting additional floor area. Depending on what zone you're in, 
it might be 15% uh, more for area or 25% more. In the handout, Margarita has pointed out to me that I have made an error, that uh, you, you get an increase in the number of units, but you don't get an increase in the floor area for the R6 zone. So the, the two family zone, it's just the R7 to the, to the one acre, you get the 15% increase in floor area. Um, we, we hadn't had a chance to go through that as thoroughly as uh, we might. Um, uh, the, the Historic District Commission meets once a month. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the chair, Steve Bishop, uh, really looks to accommodate uh, everyone uh, who is interested in preserving uh, historic structures because that's what they're there to do. Um, and you have to have uh, some history on the property uh, and uh, it helps to have an architect involved that can describe why those particular features of this building are worthy of preservation. Uh, you do get these incentives, but there are strings attached. Uh, so that if you want to make a change in the future, you're required to go back to the Historic District Commission for anything that you might want to do. Uh, once you have that certificate of appropriateness, then you go to the Planning and Zoning Commission, which would rezone the property to an historic overlay and also uh, provide a site plan and special permit approval as part of that. So it, it's, it's significantly more involved than what you would do with a, an ADU. And perhaps an ADU would be the easier way to go, uh, which is really what the commission is trying to encourage with the new regulation. Um, but if, if the goal is to preserve the building and you understand that that's in perpetuity, um, a historic overlay uh, can, be, can be effective uh, as, a, as a tool for maximizing value uh, and preserving uh, distinctive homes in town. This has been a bit of a struggle for us. Uh, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Uh, there was a house on a very large piece of property, it was large enough to enable a second residence on it with the HO. With the, but the overlay looks to keep the character of neighborhoods. And what we were looking for is to not have lots be cluttered and look dense. So the second building has to be subsidiary to the first. It has to look supportive of it. In this case, the people proposed building a second very large house. And it was a neighborhood that just did not work with that. Uh, so we denied it and we were sued and it's gone back and forth for a long time and I'll stop there. But that was one where it was difficult to do. Right now we have another one, which I can't talk much about because it's a pending application. But if you've seen it, Chris Franco at Five Brookridge. So that works really well because he's gonna keep the building. He's gonna have a total of six units because it's an oversized lot, it's in the R20. And he's on septic so the septic can accommodate what he's adding and it's a residential use. So that is a great way to get value out of a residential property where people wouldn't really want a single big house anymore because the post road is very busy, but they would be interested in a pied a tear. So there's different things. We've seen different attempts to do this. I think the bonus FAR is a good thing because it gives you 25% more FAR in the big zones and you can get the bigger rooms that people want while still retaining the smaller rooms of, a, of an old house. Uh, we've found this to be a pretty successful regulation, although every time we get an application, there are people who object to how much density we're allowing. But you're always gonna get that in Greenwich. People fight density. That's standard. Yeah. This particular option rather than the ADU may help if you have an undersized lot and you don't have as much FAR as you would like to have. It, and this gives you the bonus uh, for additional square footage that you wouldn't get uh, just going the ADU route. So the, you, have, you have to look at the particular circumstances. Uh, do you have a, a lot that if it's undersized, 
and you're going for an ADU, well, you have to go for a special permit site plan anyway. You might, if you have an, a building that would be worthy of preservation, go through the historic overlay route because it's basically the same process that you would go through for yeah. an ADU on a, and on a, a small And a couple lot. of things on that. I'm on the Greenwich Historic Preservation Network, as uh, Stacy said. So we're very interested in preserving historic homes. The um, bar at the Historic District Commission is fairly low. The house needs to be built before 1940, um, but George Washington didn't have to sleep there. Um, it, you know, if it's if it preserves the historic uh, historic house, and it's once again, as they said, it's, it's the ex exterior. Uh, the other thing is the formula for an additional unit is 1.5 times, and as as Tom says, if you have an undersized lot, and it's rounded up. So if you come in at 1.1 buildable units, then they round it up to two. Um, and that's, that's very helpful where you do have an, uh, an undersized lot. Um, one of the issues, as Margarita said, is, is the other unit needs to be subordinate. So if you've got the small little cottage up front, um, you can't build the massive house behind it but can you expand the cottage up front and then and build a subordinate unit at the same time? I think so. so. Let, yeah. Yeah. So that's 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 one way around it. If somebody wants a six but, or eight thousand square foot, but house. you're basically avoiding historically is to have the look of two big structures on one property and begin to crowd it. You don't want to get rid of. You don't want to lose the look. Of, of Greenwich. And I'm gonna plug right now, we're gonna do another survey. I said, the look of Greenwich, we wanna ask you again, we asked you four years ago, five years ago, and we just wanna refresh the information. What your clients tell us or their main, tell you are the main reasons for coming here. We know location is huge, so we can't do much about that. We're not gonna move the town, but, what else are you hearing, the feedback you're hearing? And Stacy's about to do another survey. We, we like to know that we are still a premier destination and that we're, our regulations are doing that and that, that's, that our changes in the regulations keep our draw um, and, and protect that, that aura that we have because it, it is a prestige. You hear, you hear people talk about Greenwich and it has a name, it is a brand. So go ahead. Yeah. One I'm other, sorry, I digressed. But. I, was, I was just going to mention one other thing. As Tom said, if you are in a, in a residential zone and you're doing historic overlay, you can, you, uh, it's one of the few times you can put businesses into those zones. My understanding is if it's within 500 feet of a business zone, you can put whatever allowed uses are in that business zone in that house which previously was residential. So we're residential realtors, but this gives us a lot more options to add value to the property. Oh, so that's a good thing that you touched on. We also, during COVID, we eased up the home office regulations to make it easier for people to work from home. It used to be much stricter than it is and people started calling us and so we eased it up. So it is, it is it, we do try to limit the traffic to a house. But if you're working from home and have a home office, it's a lot easier to do now. Uh, we've had to with COVID. Yeah, I, I think the point of these two regulations that we've been talking about are to provide for additional housing opportunities in town, really without changing the character of the neighborhood uh, at all. Uh, so it, it benefits the homeowner uh, it benefits the town in terms of having additional uh, housing opportunities, uh, and it keeps the character rough, roughly the same. So that that that's really where the commission's been going on on these types of changes to the regulations. And sometimes people think it's going to be a hassle. I lived in Short Hills for a while in New Jersey, and I, I was in a historic home in a historic district, and it is not. People, they're so glad on those commissions that you're trying to save the old houses that they're pretty easy on you about what you do. They were great to work with. And I'd, every time you change windows, though, you got to go to them. So there is that. 
You can repaint though without having to go to the historic district. But if you change the appearance of the house, then you would need to go back to them. They're pretty good about it. I mean, if uh, if you're just changing shutters or something like that. Now, if you're putting on, you know, a whole porch and a balcony, and um, putting on a roof that isn't historic looking, yeah, you'll have issues. So let's move on to the uh, actual lot split where you've got an oversized lot. Um, and this one, we see a lot of it in the two and four acre zone, but in this situation, a homeowner has 0.6 acre lot in an R12 zone, which as we know, minimum size there is 0.275. So he's got more than twice the space. The parcel has a lot of street frontage, uh, but it's not that deep. The owners would like to split the lot and build a house for their son and daughter-in-law who are moving back to the area from LA. So Tom, what, uh, what do these clients' options have as to um, what they can do with their property? So uh, uh, Greenwich, because it's a special act town, which Margarita can expand on because she believes very strongly that that creates a very great distinction for us. Uh, we have a different definition of subdivision than the rest of the state. So there are 168 towns that define subdivision as dividing property into three or more parcels. In Greenwich, uh, since 2006, the RTM changed the regulation at the request of the Planning and Zoning Commission. So the R definition is two or more parcels. There, there used to be a, prov a provision for lot splits, or we called them free throws. And that uh, was in effect until 2006. Uh, before that, you, uh, you would go in and file an application to the Planning and Zoning Commission asking for a subdivision. And then the Planning and Zoning Commission would say, well, this is not a subdivision. And they would deny your application which made it difficult for me when I was telling clients, congratulations, you've been denied, because that doesn't really make much sense. But then again, it, it's zoning. So. Uh, uh, it, wait, this is when he, did you say that you were on the commission at one point? Did you actually confess? I, I, I sat here uh, for six years uh, on the Planning and Zoning Commission. It just seemed a lot longer. <laughs> Well, that's when they started the meetings later and they went to one and two in the morning. Uh, I think our our record was 5 a.m. And it wasn't unusual to do three, 3 a.m. You've had a few 3 a.m.s too. Yeah, but now we start at four o'clock in the afternoon because... Yeah, so th then if you go to midnight, it's not that late, even though you've been sitting there for eight hours. Um, another thing to okay. talk about. Um, so, uh, I, okay, we, so we only all have on at Zoom. this point is... He can have a nap. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> that, that's when they stick me at the end of the meeting. Um, uh, the only provision that we have in our regulations now is a subdivision application, which is a bit more involved than the other uh, options we've been talking about. Uh, you have to have a surveyor. The surveyor has to prepare a topographic plan, and a, a subdivision plan showing that the two lots meet the zoning regulations in that particular zone. So if we're in the uh, R12 zone with uh, Mark's example, uh, we have to have 80 feet of frontage for each lot. Uh, we have to have a minimum of 12,000 square feet. Uh, we have to be able to fit a rectangle that's 60 by 100 square feet, uh, 60 by 100. And um, we also have to provide either an open space parcel or a conservation easement area that's up to 15%. The regulation says up to 15%. Uh, if you go to the commission, for, if you have it available, they want the 15%. If you have a lot like this one uh, that the, Mark's using as the example, uh, you're gonna have the 15% extra and the commission will want that as an open space parcel, frankly, because it makes the lots smaller and you can build smaller houses on them. Well, uh, also because 
you guys have heard this, you all know, uh, the two principal complaints we get in town is traffic and flooding, right? Across the board, that's the issue. One of the things with flooding is impervious surface is what's paved and what doesn't have trees in it. So we are valuing the open space more and more anywhere we can get land that is not developed and provides a better chance for stormwater management. It's not huge, but it's something so that you don't just develop to the max all the time. And we're trying to find that balance because of the flooding. Uh, it just, the storm events, even a minor rain like this week flooded people. I mean, I wasn't thinking it was a big storm, but there was significant flooding in parts of town. And just because it did rain hard at one point. So we look, we're more and more looking for that 15% set aside because of the sustainability aspect, the drainage, and of course, the keeping the green in Greenwich. Uh, it isn't so much about not maxing out the size of the houses anymore, but what you do with the land that's left over. Um, do you, are you going to talk about variances? No, right? Oh, uh, well, it, uh, one of the other things that you're looking at when you're looking at uh, dividing the property is how does that relate to an existing house that you may want to be keeping on the property? You need to meet the setbacks in the R12 zone. You have to have a minimum of 10 feet on the side yard, total of uh, 25. So uh, how does that work with an existing dwelling or an existing uh, detached building? Uh, in terms of where you would put that lot line. Uh, and you have to keep the lot shape. Uh, it, it's, you, you go to a surveyor and you say, well, this is what I'm thinking. Uh, and how would I meet the zoning regulations to create a separate lot here? Um, you can also do it as a flag lot or a rear lot. Uh, that's where the 20 foot access way, and it has to be a minimum of 20 feet and can't be more than 35 feet. That was, that was another lawsuit I filed against the commission results in that regulation. Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the access way itself does not count as part of your zoning lot area. So you have to have that if it's a rear lot. You're taking that away. You're looking at the 15% and you have to be meeting the minimum lot size. Now, if you don't have enough land area, uh, you can ask the commission to provide for a smaller open space parcel and then have a conservation easement area for the remaining portion of that 15%. Uh, so it's a, a combination of both a parcel that's set aside and then also a restriction on one or both of the lots that you're developing that that land would be protected as uh, as a uh, undevelopable portion of their property. Uh, and there are a few ways to do that. If you don't have the required frontage or you don't have the lot shape, you can apply to the Board of Appeals for a variance of that. Uh, I haven't seen too many of those recently, but uh, over the years, uh, particularly in, in areas like Byram or uh, Pemberwick or or Chickahominy, uh, where you have properties that have been developed essentially on 5,000 square foot lots, 50 by 100, uh, the, the Board of Appeals has considered granting variances because of how the neighborhood has developed really before there was any zoning in town. Uh, and so just because you don't meet the minimum lot size doesn't mean that you can't move ahead uh, with an application, but then the process is filing a preliminary subdivision application with the Planning and Zoning Commission, then going to the Board of Appeals for a variance, and then going back to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a, a final subdivision. I just did one on uh, Sheep Hill, um, on, excuse me, on Palmer Hill Road uh, for that, where we needed to get uh, a variance. Uh, we also had a, a lot line revision, which th there, there's no process or, or uh, form for a lot line revision. That's also a subdivision application. But instead of telling you you're denied, they say we have determined that it is not a subdivision or resubdivision. It's just a lot line revision. You know, it's interesting because sometimes people don't want to get rid of oversized lots. They want to be able to have twice mm -hmm. the house size. 
And you guys know that, that there's an appeal to a really large lot as well, because you get a much bigger house and we see some monster houses, really, really large houses that because the lot, the lot accommodated it because it was a double lot. Um, by the way, we're also seeing on these very large houses, which you may not see the development plans, we're back to the early 2000s. We, we were just joking about that. When everybody wants a wine cellar, a beauty salon, a massage room. And the, yeah, it's amazing. And I read an article about what's called the advent of the hermit consumer, that people don't want to go places as much where they're going to be in someone's space. And so they want, if you're wealthy, you want the facilities on site and you want someone to come to you. And we're suddenly seeing more and more of those ancillary uses in the big houses. For a while it died down and a number of applications for the very large houses died down. And now we're seeing that people want just tons of stuff that they had stopped asking for. And it's, it's kind of fun to look at what people dream up that they really want, if you can, if you can do it. Tom, one of the questions is, let's say you have an area like Chickahominy where there's been, where the subdivision was done back in the twenties or thirties um, and all the lots are undersized. And for whatever reason, um, your client bought an oversized lot that um, had been um, platted, but he bought them together. And so it's only one tax ID number. Um, can he go in and ask for a subdivision of his 0.28 lot into 2.14 2 lots? Uh, short answer is yes, but that's the more involved process that I was describing. You have to go for a preliminary subdivision application to planning and zoning. Then you have to go get a variance of, of probably frontage and, uh, and area. If it's a 5,000 square foot lot, you're required in the R6 zone to have 7,500 square feet. So you'd be asking for a smaller parcel to be approved. Uh, frontage requirement in that zone is 60 feet. You might only have 50, so you need a variance for that. Um, had one over on Booth Court years ago. I think I got six or seven variances for it. Probably not something that would happen today with the current Board of Appeals, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but it, just because you don't meet the minimum lot size doesn't mean that you can't do it. I, I think is is the point. So one thing, and and you you guys you Tom see this more when someone buys say two adjoining properties, is it better for them to keep the tax IDs to pay tax on it separately in case they ever want to subdivide? So uh, the, this, this is commonly referred to by members of the bar as checkerboarding. So that you have it own one parcel in the couple's name and the other parcel in one name, or you set up an LLC or you have a trust uh, where you keep them separate. Um, unless there's a real reason to combine them. And it could be because you want to lower your real estate taxes because the land would be counted as excess land and therefore taxed at a little lower rate. Uh, uh, it's best to keep your options open. So the, my recommendation would be maintain that as two separate parcels uh, because once you combine them, then you have to go through the subdivision process if you want to separate them out again. So it makes sense to, if you have two parcels to begin with, to keep it as separate, unless you're looking to you know, build, build the big house that needs to go across the property lines. If you do have the same um, ownership on the two lots, do we, do we see the doctrine of merger here where they become one lot? You're getting complicated. It exists under state law. Um, Mr. Hegney fights me on it all the time, but it exists under state law and, and, in theory, yes, but uh, we haven't forced it that I can remember. We haven't forced the issue in the last few years, although we could. So if, if you have two under that was really a nice answer, Tom. <laughs> if you have two undersized lots next to each other with a common ownership, there is a doctrine that says for planning and zoning purposes, those merge into one lot 
and you have to subdivide them unless, as Tom was saying, you have them in different ownership. This is tricky stuff. I mean, federal the ones law that, no, also see the others this. in both yeah. their names. This is section 6-9 of the regulations that it's I tricky. believe the commission will be looking at to modify in some way, mainly because one of the site, yes, okay. site plans I did on the water over in Riverside recently, um, because they're looking to actually make it read better than it does because it's it's one of those regulations that you read it and you get through and you say huh what did that mean but but i think if we're losing you a little bit i mean this is gets, gets very technical yeah, is, so if we're losing technical. you a little bit on that the bottom line is if your client has two parcels it is better to try to keep them separate because that way they have the ultimate flexibility unless as tom said they want to put a house across yeah. both of them or if they're really cheap and they don't want to pay for two buildable lots, because if the, ta the tax assessor is, if you've got two tax ID numbers, the presumption is they're buildable lots and each one will be taxed. Whereas if it was said, as said before, if you have one oversized lot or you merge the two undersized lots, then that additional acreage will be taxed at excess acreage rates, which in the two and four acre zones is like $100,000 extra. So let's throw it open to questions at this point. Um, we don't have any questions, so any, <laughs> Mr. Lowe? Uh, I may have missed an earlier question. Uh, any of these additions, whether you're creating a separate agency or presenting a Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to stay within your max FAR when you do an ADU. Yeah. So the question is, do you have to stay within the ADR if you're doing an ADU? Um, you have to stay within your max FAR. Yeah, and yeah. then you and then you then you get a bonus. So that is one time where a historic overlay may make more sense than uh, than doing an ADU. And one more when you create a park that means off. Yes, yes, it's required to be off street, but not garage. Right. Thank you. No, so, no, it does. That's an yeah. Go ahead. So we're uh, the question is if it's in an AE it's zone, in a flood zone, flood zone, uh, does that prohibit you from creating an, uh, an accessory dwelling unit? The answer is no. Uh -huh. However, you may have an issue. Uh, a garage does not need to meet the base flood elevation in a flood zone, but if it's but if it's up above, and it that and the area that you're finishing does meet the flood zone elevation, then you'd be able to do that. There's also a rule that if you spend a certain amount of money improving your house in a flood zone and your house isn't flood compliant, you guys all know this. The 50% rule. The 50 rule. Yeah. rule. You, you have to become flood compliant. And it is a battle because nobody wants to become flood compliant, but the number of phone calls we get about flooding, you know, it's a trade-off. Yeah. One um, so, so that would be your problem in an ADU in a flood zone is say you were building a new building. This is an interesting question. Where did we end up on that? If the compliant part of an, of an improvement, if, the, if an improvement is, is compliant, does that count? On the fifty percent, or does it get subtracted? It still counts. If the if the overall we just had building that does, is not compliant, you, you're and you're, you're adding still. something that is compliant. It's it's if it's detached, then it's considered you're doing that math on each structure, Correct. not on the property itself. But if you have something that's non-compliant and you're adding to it, but it, that portion that you're adding is going to be compliant that still fits within the 50% rule. We have an application that does that right now. And I remember stopping and scratching my head, but yeah, so that that's the only thing that would catch you in a flood zone. Otherwise we would treat, treat it the same. Right. One thing on that is my understanding is that the um, height of the building 
instead of being measured from ground level, so that is measured from the from the height of the floodplain. So there were a bunch of houses that were that were non-compliant, and if they were literally raised, the roof would be above the height limit. But now you measure that from the floodplain and not the ground level. But you see the impact. I mean, you've seen the houses that have been raised all over town, um, and then that's the struggle. It doesn't. It looks weird, but what are you going to do? The health department has to sign off that you can accommodate if you're adding a bedroom, that you can accommodate that additional bedroom on your septic. You just have to get a health department sign off that you can you can do that additional bedroom. The the answer is probably yes. Um, the health department, if, if you don't have uh, sufficient capacity within your existing septic then system, have to get, then they probably want but so at if least you a have show it, reserve area. And if you're adding on, the health department also wants to make sure that you're not adding on in an area where you would, could put a reserve septic area uh, and probably want you to show that as well. It gets, in septic, you're and the health department's probably going to make the process of an ADU a little bit more complicated than being but on they sewer. Let, they let people add bedrooms. Yeah. So one thing on that is the various departments are essentially siloed. So whether you're applying for an ADU or historic overlay, the health department sees it as a septic issue. The building department sees it as a building code issue. So you're gonna be expected to essentially comply with those regulations, even if it is something that planning and zoning would like, would like you to do. Uh, Sorry, ADU, Christine. Once you build the ADU smaller, or that only guest cottage. But I'm a snowbird. And I live in the guest cottage and I rent out the thing. Yes. Okay. I have a neighbor who did that for years. Oh, okay. So I'll give you the example of a really successful ADU. I have a neighbor who built one within her house, a little, a little apartment, and she rented out her big house after her husband died. She rented out the rest of the house. She lived in her little accessory apartment and she wintered in Florida and it was perfect for her. The rules go either way, but you have to reside officially on your property. Once you have applied for and gotten an overlay, a new fancy house, what's small, it's behind the workhouse, and then you get transferred to London and you want to sell that, or is the buyer now limited to those two buildings have to remain exactly what you did on the or, or once you applied for and got that designation? How limited is the next one? So the, the question is, if you have a historic overlay granted and you now want to sell the historic house, what do you do? Um, do you have to sell both of them together or can you sell them separately? No, it's just what is the limitation no. that you put on yourself 100%. And the next person come in and say, I actually didn't like the historic part. I'm going to knock The down. regulations pr pr protect the historic building in perpetuity and, and the also new building you could take down well uh the by designating designating the property as an historic overlay it's the whole property that's covered mm -hmm. and you're at, at the time that's approved by the planning and zoning commission there is a declaration of restrictions to preserve what's on site and so uh, anybody who takes title to that property is taken subject to that. And in the one that we had, the one that was so tortuous, torturous, uh, the, okay, the, um, the accessory building was in the front, like a little um, carriage house. That was, the, that was their idea. Only it was, I don't know, 4,000 square, 5,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but it was in the front. So you had the big house up on the hill and then you had a small building in the front that was looked like a carriage house. And that was consistent with the neighborhood if you had it in the right scale, because a lot of the neighborhood had that was an old neighborhood. It had that kind of thing. 
We also look at how that neighborhood is laid out and landscaped. What's the feel of that area? The point is the buyer is the, on the old building. Yeah. The yeah. buyer is subject to what was approved by the Planning right. and Zoning Commission and is there's a declaration that's recorded on the land records so that they'll see that as part of the, uh, the um, transaction. So the next question for you would be what happens to the value of the property and the resale value? The research is it goes up. I never know whether we're reading what we want to read, but the research, there are people who want the protection of a historic overlay. They want to know that their neighborhood is safe. And in fact, um, you can do a lot to protect a neighborhood that's a National Register historic neighborhood from overdevelopment because of that. Christine? Yes, thank you. Sorry, sweetie. Um, I have questions. The first one is, Looking at this, looking at our requirement for affordable housing, we do an accessory unit. We have to go to the neighborhood. It's much more complicated. And as I understand, it has to be put on the deed. In this situation, can these ADUs be considered as affordable? Only if, so, only yeah. if you so deed the, the restrict it. So, yeah, sorry. Ma sorry, I keep forgetting. I have to repeat the question. So, the question is, if you wanted to make yours an affordable unit that counted for the state, could you do that? And the answer is yes, but you have to deed restrict it for 10 years. No, not, not, not longer. For the accessory dwelling units, it's 10 years. You would have to deed restrict it and it would have to be compliant with 830G in terms of the pricing. And you have to prove every year that you're doing it as an affordable. We had that for a while and we didn't have any takers. So we stopped. We had it, we, we had them only, we had affordable as an option and we had it all spelled out. We didn't have any takers. Um, the back country said they wanted to try it, but they didn't, you know, they really didn't in the end. And after about what a year, about two years, we just took it off and said, let's just open it up. Yeah, so I actually wrote the affordable accessory apartment regulation uh, and then proposed it to a prior board and they made three key changes which essentially gutted it. One was the maximum could be 700 square feet. So uh, this group of commissioners has done a great job of making this much more flexible and not requiring hearings. Any second question, Christine? The question is, because I'm looking back to the 2006 regulation on lot splits. Two and five. It was extremely easy, and it was also very much more affordable. And by I know. putting in the new regulation, a surveyor had it come in, which was I know. extremely expensive, all these other things. And before this, it was the right of the owner to just be able to take that lot split. And I really think that this is not a good idea, and it makes it, especially if you're in a less... Um, uh, expensive area just increases the cost of doing this so much. And it, I really would like to see it go back to the right of the owner for that split without having to do all of this as a consideration as a subdivision. It's a mixed bag. So the, the question is, uh, it's, yeah, the having it be a single cut and having a subdivision application, it just makes it more expensive. So the question is, anything planning and zoning can do about that? Well, I, it's it's a mixed bag. What do you want to? We are worried always about overdeveloping Greenwich, and I think in two thousand five the commission was worried about that. And when I look back in time, that's what everybody's focused on. It's a mixed bag. Tom and I have this argument all the time. You want to? You're, he agrees with you, Christine the two lot subdivision should not have to come to the commission. I believe it was started as an effort to protect Greenwich from overdevelopment and development that wasn't thought through. I understand that it's more expensive. You could probably change the rules somewhat to make it easier for people to do it two lot. Um, but it does, I believe it adds some value what it does is take somebody who's in a less expensive area. It's just a lot split. It's what exists. It's not undersized lots. It's a double lot being split and certainly consistent with an R6 neighborhood as an example. And therefore, 
to add on to this expense, just like we've changed part of the FAR, where it was like, you couldn't do your attic, you couldn't do your basement. So there's been changes for that. Right, we've we eased up on that. that if we're gonna make it um, possible to have the building that we need to create for my daughter-in-law to move next door to help take care of me, let me make that lot split. And don't make it so expensive that the building of that building that structure then becomes way over value that. What are people's? Uh, <clears throat> this decision is with the RTM okay. because the RTM is the body that can amend the subdivision regulations. They haven't done much okay. since night since 1970 when our current subdivision regulations, as except for this significant change, were adopted. Uh, but it's it's the RTM's call on amending the subdivision regulations, well, well, we would not have the commission. We would have to submit it to them, though. Oh, Fran? Right. Could you repeat what you said about subsidiary structures? If the state dictates that the store is smaller than the one that shows up on the back, that will sometimes require Um Well, in general, we're looking. It, 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 the question is, when you're looking for a second structure on a lot to be subsidiary, you in a historic overlay, the, the, what do you what factors are you looking at? And the answer is, you are looking for consistency with that neighborhood, with the character of that neighborhood. If it has carriage houses, does it have does it have separate garages? How what would fit in well with that neighborhood? Um, I, I back to the two lot subdivision. I think it does bring an important value to town. Um, I'm, I'm open to hearing arguments. I hear the cost one, but we are slammed with development, and that's that's always the battle. Um, we haven't seen it slow down since 2020. And it is hard to keep what we are. We want to evolve. We want to be open to new ideas. But at the same time, we believe that what draws people to this community is that sense of green and space. Uh, I suppose you could do something different for the smaller zones. I haven't thought about that. Well, uh, the other alternative would be if you have uh, a client who uh, is not able to get a, a two lot subdivision to challenge that in court and claim that we the fight town about this all the time. Make its own rule as to what the definition of a subdivision is, which is contrary to the statute, whether it's a special permit town or not. Something that would be interesting to discuss with the town attorney's office in the future. He's already done that. I. I, I <laughs> I, I haven't doing had, that for 20 I haven't years. had the case yet that we could bring it to the Connecticut Supreme Court and the Connecticut Supreme Court would say, you know, Greenwich, you're really part of the state of Connecticut and you really need to abide by our st statutes that define it as three or more parcels. We're part. Wait, wait, we're but, part of, wait, 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 we're part of the state of Connecticut? <laughs> the, uh, Danielle. One of them is, if you already have a building, let's say you're in an R7 plan and you want to do the test for all three, you already have a test building that's called this for a Can you get a variance to make that into an accessible block? Or do you have some highly specialized that? Uh, you would Good need question. to, yes. So if you have an accessory building that's in greater in square footage than what's permitted as of right, and you still want to make it into a, an ADU, uh, how do you go about that? And the uh, answer is that you have to file a, a site plan and special permit application with the Planning and Zoning Commission. That, that's how the regulation currently reads. And the other thing is, what is already in the historic district of John Williams and you've got enough size, but you want to add on, um, you want to add on to own house, a changing the exterior of want to add on the Are you allowed to do that? Are you close to the HPC? Are you with it? 
So repeat the question. So the question is, if you're in a historic designated area, and the, uh, I, uh, do you have to go through the process to get additional square footage? Can you? Um, sh short answer is yes. Uh, there, there are many different kinds of historic designations. There's a state designation. There's our, uh, like Strickland Road is a designated historic district in town that has separate regulations and rules that apply versus something that's either federally designated or state designated. Uh, what we're talking about here is that you're actually taking that particular parcel and designating, designating, designating it in a separate zone, this historic overlay zone, just for that piece, that, that parcel. So you'd have to go through that process, even if it's in the, the fourth ward or, or one of the other historic areas. Mm -hmm. You live in the fourth ward. Not a problem. Because it's a historic district. Doesn't matter. Well, you're going through. You're you're going you're going to go to the historic district commission for that. And and it's and it's complicated because there's several types of historic designation, mm. and the and the fourth ward is not the strictest one because it's not a local historic district. That's the one that the HDC really controls. The The fourth ward is federal and it has, you can change the exterior. Paul? You forgot that. Paul, oh, hi. Yeah, because you're below the minimum. I'm sorry, he's asking about a drainage plan, whether you have to do a drainage plan when you add an external ADU, you would be at the exemption level, right, for a dra for drainage. But if you're doing an, an, a separate structure, you're going to be able to do it for less, and it's a thousand, I just checked this last night, it's a thousand, a thousand square feet. It's a thousand square feet. So you could do your ADU without doing the drainage. And, but by the way, I think that. Well, um, that, uh, that's, yeah, come you, on. You have to provide the parking space. Oh, that's a hundred square feet. Do come on. Parking. That's a, if you have to, if you add, so overall the, the, the drainage exemption is a, I thought it was 2,000 in some cases. It's 1,000. Okay. So it's 1,000 square feet. So you would not have to. That said, talking about flooding, we think it should get stricter. Uh, I just, we've just got to be so careful about impervious surface right now. Uh, I, Brian, I think okay. just to follow up on, on Paul's question, I, the, the, the concept here is that you take what you have and you, maximize the value either through using a portion of your home or an accessory building, a garage, a pool house, so that you can actually take what's already on site. Does it prohibit you from new construction? No, but I, I think it's more along the lines of what, what's on the site now and what, what can you do with what's there? Brian? On the what are the set? The accessory building. So the question is, what are the setbacks on an AD, on an a, on an ADU as an accessory structure? You well, it depends on where that accessory structure is. If it's in the rear yard, yes, then and it's behind the house, then you uh, can use the accessory structure setbacks. For example, in the uh, four acre zone, rather than a seventy five foot rear yard setback and fifty on the sides, you can be thirty five feet from the property line because it's in the rear of the property. Um, but if it's in the side or in the front, then it needs to meet the setbacks that are required for a primary structure. And is there more people that are on septic that don't have the, the additional area for septic or an ADU just in possible to in a or something like that they use in RVs? I don't do health department. I don't know. That, that, so 
Can can you use something other than an expanded septic system if you don't have the room to expand your septic system for an ADU? Uh, that that would require a review by the health department. Yeah. I think that would be a hard sell. Yeah, actually. once again, that's in a silo. There are some new systems where there are individual units that are put on the septic fields that increase their capacity. And so you shorten the length of the field. Yeah. But once again, it's a, it's a health department issue. Now, actually the lady behind you, you've had enough. Yeah, we just did the math on this. Sure, because you're improving your house. The question is, if you take out, oh, sorry. Okay, so the question was, are there property tax implications? Yes, because you're doing an improvement. You're gonna take out building permits. And if it's a barn, you are now making it finished space and you're adding a bedroom. And um, so you do get, to the extent that you improve your property, they're gonna, they're going to assess yeah. you higher to take that question further. Yeah. Well, okay. So if it exists and it's not legal, that means that you didn't take out a building permit. That means that the building department doesn't know about it. And the tech, you, that's what yeah. I'm saying. So, and I, yeah. Oh, if you just wanted to rent it and you and you did it all legal and legit with building permits, yeah, I think you'd be okay. There's no yeah, improvement. So I'm on they the just board tax of you on the improvement. Oh, you're yeah. on the board of assessment. Yeah, I'm on the Go. board of assessment appeals. So basically, Sorry. no, no problem. The the bo the bottom line with the tax assessor is what's the fair market value of the property. Now, the nice thing is if you rent out a residential unit. Uh, in a commercial unit, you um, you do a return on investment expenses over income type approach. Uh, she doesn't do that uh, if it's primarily a residential structure. So if you're renting out your house, that's not going to change your your taxes to the extent that you. And as Margarita said, it is the certificate. It's the building application that triggers their oversight. And then for large houses, if it takes more than a year to finish, you will get taxed on a partial value. And it's whatever it is on October 1st of whichever, of whichever year uh, that the grand list is being done. So if you start, uh, if you start the work on October 2nd, um, you know, it's gonna, have, it's gonna have no effect or the same thing as if you have a fire. On October second, they're still going to they're still going to tax you as if it was a uh, a full building. Whereas if the fire was in August, there um, uh, you need to apply, but you'll you'll get a reduction. In the case in the case of a rental, it doesn't change it. What does change it is you build a really beautiful apartment. The question is how much more would somebody would somebody pay for that, and you don't really necessarily look at the revenue stream. So, so what what makes it a, essentially a dwelling unit? What uh, and what constitutes a kitchen? Um, you have to have cooking facilities. Um, it, it's sort of what what's a wet bar, John? So, uh, wet bar you can have an undercounter refrigerator. You can have a. Uh, a bar sink that's no more than 250 square inches. Um, but I've had it with pool houses where the uh, zoning has said, well, you know, you have a washer and dryer. I'm like, well, yeah, I, not everybody has a washer and dryer in their kitchen. Uh, but they say, we don't want you to have that in your pool house. Well, so I have to schlep the towels back to my house to wash them. Why can't I leave them at the so, pool house? So that, that, that whole thought of what is a kitchen, I think is evolving. Uh, and it, you know, do, do you have a dishwasher? 
does the dishwasher make it a kitchen? Not necessarily. It's really cooking facilities that 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 provide. They have traditionally it. done yeah. that. So, so the answer to your question is: so my friend who has uh, who has rumors, she has your 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 situation where she has a microwave, a sink, but they have no real cooking facilities, an under the counter fridge, and that's a rumor. And then when you go to a full cooking facility, it becomes an accessory dwelling unit. And she couldn't do that because she couldn't do the parking. So Margarita, one of, the one of the things that I've always kind of used as a rule of thumb is, is there an oven? Because, uh, you know, you have cooktops, you have microwaves, you have refrigerators, uh, you have a dishwasher. Uh, but without an oven, does that constitute a kitchen? And, and you know how many people make chicken in their grills and bake a chicken in their grills. So where is an oven? You can make a cake in a in an outdoor grill. So it really is more of of an in the eye of the beholder when you make the application. I, yeah. If it feels like a kitchen, it's a kitchen. Yeah. I that's I've actually heard people say that. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. if it has I mean, a right? full size refrigerator and yeah. cooking facilities, it's going to be considered full size stove. And a full size fridge. Now, there, right. There's one thing I did want to mention on all about three having of these to wash your towels that we're talking about. I'm changing the subject now. Okay. <laughs> um, that uh, we've neglected one agency in town, and that's the wetland agency. And that impacts pretty much all these things that we've been talking about ADUs, historic overlay, uh, subdivisions, uh, because if you have wetlands on your property and you're looking to build something, you have to talk to them. And, and it doesn't so have to be on your property. It's with, you know, or, or within a hundred feet of your property, foot, yeah. hundred foot uh, review area. So that that's, that's another stop before you actually file with the planning and zoning commission on any of these is to see what, if anything you have to do with the wetland agency and under state law, the, Planning and Zoning Commission can't render a decision on an application unless the wetland agency has reviewed it first. So, so Tom, could you just talk briefly about the levels of review at wetlands? What's the minimum that you need? Uh, let's say so, there are no wetlands, so, so you the, still go there and you get a check off. Uh, they, there... There's the green sheet, which is the green sheet because it's green. Um, and you send that in with a survey and they look in their records and they say, no, uh, you don't need anything from us. And they sign off on it and you're done. They used to charge $30 for that. Now it's free. Um, and it's something you can do on your own rather than, uh, than requiring a, a, a surveyor or an engineer to do it for you. Uh, if it's within a hundred feet, uh, they may require an application uh, and they may review it in their office and approve it uh, without a hearing, uh, depending on how close you are and what activity you're involved with, that would be an, an agent review or agent approval. Uh, uh, and then you could have one where you have to file the application and actually they do a consent so that you don't have to actually show up at a hearing. And then if you do have a potential impact to wetlands, then it would be an actual hearing with the wetland agency and, and they meet the uh, the uh, fourth Monday of every month. Um, I'm going to change the subject for just a little second. We've just been joined by the town planner. He's the head of the planning and zoning department. I, 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 I wasn't going to say that. Actually. Well, actually, I had asked him if he could come towards the end of the session so that if you all wanted to talk about anything that he's right in the back, waving his hand, wave again. He's got the town ID on. Okay. And, um, if if you all want to ask him anything about going to the department, things that have come up, how to process an accessory dwelling unit with the department, he's the expert on that. Uh, we have counter hours Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday in the mornings where there's always someone available to answer your questions. You can also call, but he's here and happy to provide any assistance. Okay, so let's do two more questions and then we'll wrap up. If uh, anybody else have a question, Dale. What do you mean? Oh, so oh yeah, the, the you question talk is, about that. What, what if there are deed restrictions on the property? So there are two things that you deal with 
on a piece of property. One are the public restrictions, which are the zoning regulations, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, but you also could have restrictions that were put in place probably before there were zoning regulations, just to protect the property values of that particular area. Uh, and those are separate and apart from the zoning regulations. So you have to meet those also. So for example, if you're in Deer Park and the setback in your deed says 60 feet, even though the zoning regulation may allow you to build within 25 feet of the property line, under that, rate, under, under that restriction, you have to meet the 60 feet. Tom, just out of, I, I know like um, there were racial restrictions in the past. What, what deed restrictions are essentially invalid and which are, and which are, are challengeable? So uh, the, the Supreme Court has, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that those types of restrictions that are discriminatory are, are no longer enforceable. Uh, even and there's a movement to have them expunged from deeds, and uh, that would be something you talk to a title company about. What, can we just take this out of the deed because it's no longer legal? Uh, the the ones that really apply here are often setbacks, uh, uses that say you can only have one dwelling unit on the property, uh, and an ADU would be considered a dwelling unit. Um, uh, uses on the site, you're only allowed to have uh, residential use. Those are the kinds of things that, you, that we saw in, in the older deeds. Uh, we don't have as many in the deeds here that, that are uh, discriminatory uh, as you might see in other parts of the country. Yes, and you have to read those restrictions very closely because as Tom was saying, some say residential use, some say uh, a single dwelling, some say a single family dwelling. So all of those can lead to different responses. What happens when you've got a 1920 subdivision and it requires certain setbacks, but you know, since that time, of the 14 houses on the street, six of them have violated that. So if if the restriction is no longer being honored as how the it was originally put in place in that particular area, uh, oftentimes the title company will insure over that restriction so that you're able to build based on the zoning regulations, not on that particular restriction. Any last questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. I hope this has been helpful.